culture sociologist Roland Robertson coined back in 1994 this term. He was the one that first adopted it, but it's not a novel term. He found it in a dictionary uh, of Japanese marketing. Japan in the 1980s started post globalization in the sense what we see a global flow of goods, services, information, you name it, but there are some, still some cultural, local, specific features about the spread of these goods, global goods, that need to be taken into consideration, that cannot be disregarded. And the main point that Robertson raised was that globalization is not a logic, it doesn't follow the logic uh, universal logic. It doesn't follow the logic of different societies converging into the homogeneous substance. Rather, globalization is something that is making defining globalization and gives us this notion that the talk about local and specific, we are not dealing with national dimension, we must have to do with ethnic background with way of life in modern cities, this is something that is nowadays is done in global terms. And Robertson cares about communication, he cares how people exchange ideas about themselves and one another, but at that he says that globalization provokes no new local features. I can give you just, just an example from the research findings, my research on music first and foremost. In different regions, for example, of Italy, we see a surge of interest for traditional music, for Tarantella, for example, in the south of Italy. Why did it happen back in the 1990s? Because of the spread of internet, folklore uh, studies, Specialists were just a self-contained group, but nowadays they're available online and young people listen to them and try to correlate to this tradition. It seems to me that despite Roberts had saying many uh, correct and fair things, he also noted a pretty much substantial point that he made, that cosmopolitanism, which in this or other way is related to globalization, uh, does not necessarily have European origin alone. He refers to African um, specialists who coined his own theory. He was trained and educated in UK. So he says that our self-perception is something as the center of the world, and tribalism in the Western sense of the world was not typical of African communities. He finds among African traditions many elements they might be referred to as cosmopolitan. He thinks that European uh, universalism fails to reflect the diversity of ideas about cosmopolitan space. But at that, it seems to me that globalization 1.0 seems to disregard several important points. Firstly, he, the author speaks about local features, mostly in national terms. Some of you have mentioned national states. Well, very much at the same time, we see many studies published which focus on microscale, meaning how different cities and towns develop cosmopolitan space. Just some districts, just some sites in towns may be cosmopolitan, whereas other locations within the same town or city may look very different. Besides, it seems to me Robertson still deliberates along the lines of what is known top-down. He says that the globalization works. It's a process that still seems to be stimulating, stimulated and promoted by major corporations. He seems to persuade that some regions should demonstrate what is special about them. And it's more important to point out that, or rather, if we want to correct the zoom, would be to see what the bottom-up or globalization from below. Bottom-up globalization, another piece I would like to refer to. Regrettably, it's little known in Russia. A French sociologist, Alain Tayus, who published a book on his study of ethnic, market, ethnic markets in Marseille. 
He ran a study for over 20 years in Marseille, these ethnic markets, where he met Afghan, Afghani um, traders there, peddlers. He wanted them to take him along with him. And he discovered this picture that these Afghani merchants buy something in Afghanistan, then they travel to Turkey and sell it there, then they travel to the keep, like, seem to be fine tuning trying to adjust to the special features of each national market. Moreover, he points out that all the markets he studied, they will always have been cosmopolitan, and that happened long before they started discussing globalization. He said he just traveled with them in the same truck. He traveled in North Africa, then got back to Afghanistan and discovered an infrastructure in place of this informal, or if you say, under the board economy. This is some new nomads uh, of the informal economy, so, sort of. And he asked those merchants, but to a certain extent, you continue following the same routes that evolved back in the Middle Ages. It's part of the Silk Road. And he answered, got the answer that really strongly impressed him, where these Afghani merchants told him, what it would you mean? Is there any other track in place? any other route in place, and it became obvious to him that he can't discuss cosmopolitanism from European perspective, universal perspective. Again, as they now speak about globalization from below, they mostly discuss civil society, non-NGOs, and so on and so forth. But beyond that, there is a number of social connections that seem to be um, disregarded by these categories. And I would like to in my presentation, try to adopt the logic used by Tyrios as he started the economy, try to use it for cultural practice. Robertson is a cultural sociologist, but he mostly discusses culture because of the market, because of the media. He seems to say nothing about art. So I'll try to present to you three case studies, which I already mentioned, each of them may give us new ways, new visions. What cosmopolitanism is about today? First is that what I did last year and early this year in Berlin, where I interviewed Syrian actors mostly who found themselves in a situation when they had to immigrate and right now, they uh, try to build their career from scratch in Berlin. But they continue their professional career. They want to be actors, continue to be actors. And I realized that there is a very uh, close-knit community of graduates from the Damask Institute of Performing Arts. It surprised me how much smarter and were more educated they are than me. First, they speak a great number of languages. They're fluent in French as well as English. They learn German pretty fast. Arabic, in this case, well, it's a mother tongue. And secondly, it seemed to me quite surprising. I came there with pretty naive perceptions that they don't feel that they represent Syrian culture. They say there is no such notion as Syrian theater. They say there is just theater. And in this sense, they're very upset by stereotypes that circulate in the German society. And I was wondering what this High Institute for Drama and Performing Arts, why these people before the war, how they were shaped the way they were. So I interviewed a Russian Scenographer who taught in Damask for 10 years, and he told me how this institute works. Indeed, it has a very surprising history. It's like an intellectual center of the Arabic world, where students from Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Palestine would come to. And I'd like to say that Damascus also may be perceived as a cosmopolitan city. It has always been the face, and all my informants seem to say, but this community of students who used to attend this institute, well, I tried to see why that was the case. 
Firstly, this institute was founded late in the 1970s by a drama artist, Skalavanus. He uh, really did political theater. He wrote very critical pieces, and he, in his work, he spoke about authoritarian regime in Syria. But at the end of the 1970s, he was still appointed president or rector of this institute, university. And, from, and this is where he hosted a festival which was attended by drama writers from the Arabic world. And the very fact that what he described me about Syria, it described it in strongly resembled me Moscow of the 1970s. Uh, I mean, where students and teachers, but they drank a lot. They gathered in a Christian um, quarter where there are bars. Thankfully, they seem to be criticizing the government and the shows. This is where authorities were criticized in the, well, in the um, uh, indirectly. For example, they may be uh, just. Uh, just running Hamlet and uh, with the context that it is just with the Syrian subtext. And they really staged Richard III. So the piece is that sooner or later all the kings have to go. After which people somehow got very upset uh, because he needed to get back to Saudi Arabia. So this is this community in Damask that was very well aware of what is going on in the European theater and in the Russian theater too, because many of the teachers used to study in Russia. And again, this Russian theater designer, a scenographer, he used to point out that the students had phenomenal craving for knowledge. They were longing for knowledge. They read books all kinds of books. They went to the French Center, they went to Goethe Institute, they watched the retrospective display of old uh, cinema. Uh, this case, they, they, they studied by Dr. Kaligari that no, you can't really entice people to attend this. And there's a difficult situation in Europe in a sense that very much like in Kazakhstan, there's this program underway. They attended uh, these studies for free, but they had to do what they known like job placement, so where they worked for five years. And many of them, as they left Syria, would apply for political asylum. They had good reasons for that. And this en masse immigration, intellectual immigration, it began well before the known events. But surely, since 2011, this process became quite problematic. Right now, the Syrian intellectual elite is now emigrated to the Netherlands, Germany, and France. In this sense, I found it very important to understand uh, how do feel the people like this feel in Berlin, how they find and say, seek self-expression. I'd like to share with you this case. He's a director and playwright, Anis Hamdun. His grandfather was a well-known professor in this Institute for Performing Arts, Harfan Bobu. He is a professor who taught a theater speech and uh, performance speech. And uh, he just took part in the, when Holmes was bombed. He had to leave for Damascus where his friends were arrested and they died in the, as they were jailed by the special services. And he fled to Egypt and Osnabrück, and this is where he started writing plays for the local theater. In 2016, uh, the trip uh, won a very uh, prestigious prize. Now, Gritzik, and this show is dedicated to in memoriam of his friends who died in the mosque in the secret prison. In Germany, there's a major problem about this because theater is highly politicized and all the theaters want to speak about migration, about refugees, but for any artist, performing artist, there is a dilemma that he faces, how he should act in such a way to avoid provoking too much sympathy. And in the case study of a piece, 
It's known as Odisa. Odisa, this is... What's Odisa? It's a diminutive uh, from uh, Odyssey. Uh, it's rather a female incarnation of, uh, of Ulysses. Um, there's uh, not a single uh, Syrian playing in this uh, drama. Uh, he mm, mm, staged it for the Berlin uh, uh, theater studio. Um, a lady, a young girl, is entering an office of a state agency. We don't know what is that agency. She has an interview. She's very uh, anxious. Uh, she has many different papers to go through. She looks, uh, she picks up um, <coughs> a ticket uh, to wait for her turn. She opens up a book and uh, she starts. Uh, she sees it's in the Odyssey, and uh, in a fantastic way, she is transported to the world of Odyssey, the Homeric world, and she is being told that she would never go back until she goes through um, through attempt uh, uh, a um, real trial. And the interview that he gave me uh, that we Syrians we were part of Greece and uh, so we had to go through these trials and tribulations. Uh, so um, the four episodes that this, this uh, girl goes through is an allusion, uh, to, allusion to the real experience that this particular um, playwright and other Syrians went through. So this uh, Odyssey, Odyssey first goes uh, to the Cyclop. Uh, and Cyclop um, kills their friends every every day. So one of the uh, of her friends dies in the cave of uh, Polythemus. Uh, then he goes uh, to the Circe uh, island, which is the refugee camp, when all of your um, uh, friends have turned into swine, into pigs, and uh, she prays. And finally, she is delivered from there. She hears the voice of the siren. Uh, who is her cousin who had been killed in Syria. And in the end, uh, she goes down to Hades. And Hades, uh, she has to uh, meet her mother. As, um, and she asks, what is to be done? Uh, uh, mother says, go uh, back to Syria and die there. You are alien here. You must not be here, which is Germany. So she understands that mother would have never tell her that. Uh, and this is a uh, the voice of a um, uh, of a uh, German neo-Nazi. Uh, there is this uh, rhetoric. Uh, why should we be bearing the responsibility for the Syrians? Let them go back, uh, and if they're not unhappy, if they're unhappy with their regime, let them war uh, for themselves. And so this uh, heroine says, uh, you were my mother, you're not my mother, you could have never said this, you're a, a German neo-Nazi. At this moment, she is uh, woken up, uh, she's transported back to the reality, um, whence uh, she emerged, uh, and uh, she has her uh, time, uh, and uh, I have uh, made up my mind, uh, and uh, Everything will be different now. Uh, and we don't know what is going to happen. Mm, we don't know what is her trial or what is her tribulation. But what is important here is that the playwright is using a metaphorical language. He uses uh, very well understood uh, constructs. But at the same time, he speaks about the Syrian experience. And people have gone to, to talk to him. Uh, and uh, people thanked him and saying that we didn't even think that there is not a single Syrian person playing in this drama. Uh, there's yet another example. How could Syrian uh, actors um, get integrated into this sphere of, uh, of uh, art? Uh, there is this uh, problem. Mm, there are two terms which are often um, go, which often go through um, in the high um, so, so artistic society. There is the uh, Hochkultur, which is high culture, and the Sozialkultur, which is uh, the uh, um, um, uh, more or less uh, uh, commonplace, and we don't see any uh, uh, theaters in the, in the Hochkultur um, where there are, so, so to speak, non-white actors. Um, 
And in one of these theaters, uh, we now have uh, a Turkish actress, which is, uh, she calls this uh, a post-migration um, theater, and there have to be people of, uh, of different uh, stock. Uh, however, it's not a social theater to integrate migrants. It's rather uh, something uh, for people to have uh, and be different uh, in uh, their artistic uh, dialogue. And uh, in 2016, um, uh, 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 Sherlin uh, decided to create uh, what she called Exile Ensemble, which is the, uh, the group or the company of exiled artists. Uh, and yet, of course, none of these really want uh, to be perceived as refugees. And so she called up uh, a Syrian uh, actor uh, who was um, Akha, uh, Majid Akha, who was uh, um, uh, a professor at the Drama Institute. But, however, he was soon uh, shadowed by the German playwrights. However, this uh, person was um, even doing uh, um, uh, drama in uh, uh, in um, uh, Syria and following the example of the Brazilian uh, street drama um, whereby the uh, socially vulnerable were given a voice uh, in these uh, street performances. So what uh, seems uh, uh, interesting to me is this: that this project, uh, the Exile Ensemble, uh, is now gone and uh, the artists all um, moved to, to other uh, theaters. Uh, um, but uh, I think that what people wanted to see in Berlin is uh, that they wanted to see the history of the of the refugees. Uh, and uh, being a professional actors, uh, they had to play the parts of refugees. And uh, uh, there was quite a bit of a um, uh, deliberate deliberate nature of this of this drama. However, the Gorky Theater uh, also had um, a play a part played because uh, you could hear um, uh, soliloquies and monologues in different languages, not just in German but also in English and in in Arabic. And there was one actress who mm, spoke uh, uh, Dari. Now this, these performances are all subtitled. Uh, the Interesting thing is is that the there are polylingual uh, societies or even um, platforms which are um, uh, gradually uh, originating in Germany. Um, if some of you know what is Neue Köln, uh, this this is an, a district where migrants from very different countries live, uh, and so one may say that. Uh, that uh, the polylingual nature of this uh, uh, community is asserted. And the last thing I would like to draw your attention to is that um, all of the actors I spoke to are quite skeptical uh, about being perceived as carriers of uh, the Syrian culture. And there in Berlin, they rethink uh, their own folklore. Um, and interestingly, uh, there was staged uh, by an Israeli uh, director who was well vilified in Israel after that. However, um, uh, their uh, greatest fear is uh, to finish their their um, uh, career as uh, teaching dabke, which is the circle dance in Syrian tradition. And to them, uh, there would be um, it would be quite a bit of a uh, uh, quite a bit of a, of a disappointment. However, they uh, created a project um, which is now um, in the theater of Sasha uh, Waltz, uh, who is a, a very, very well-known choreographer. And uh, they are teaching, in fact, Dabke to, to Germans uh, and uh, um, I think that this is an excellent way of uh, of integrating people and understanding what they are um, and uh, trying to understand 
who are these people that they have to now live in the neighborhood of? Most of them are Syrians. So one might say that the tradition, this local tradition, this uh, Near Eastern tradition is uh, being uh, reconsidered in the new cosmopolitan conflict uh, because uh, the Berliners uh, coming to these uh, uh, performances uh, are interested to get familiarized with something new. So if one may try to get uh, some draw some conclusion, it is to say that uh, there is a possibility of having um, a cosmopolitan um, uh, culture without uh, too much of a provincialism. And indeed, this is quite uh, a reciprocal process because my Syrian friends are telling me that they would like go back to Syria and even play a role uh, in the German theater because now in in, in Germany um, uh, they are uh, uh, raising up uh, subjects which they would have never been able to raise in Syria. Another interesting point is uh, the uh, um, theatrical uh, spirit of the German drama. And there is this, uh, there's a question to what extent uh, mm, uh, uh, the German theater can indeed become cosmopolitan, unlike uh, and just stand, uh, standing aside from, from the declarations. Now, Berlin mm, uh, very much likes uh, to um, project an image of a very cosmopolitan place, but the question really is to what extent can Berlin really mm, be, uh, be in line with this image. The second uh, mm, case I would like to consider, mm, and I have been invited to Shanyinka by mm, two amateur uh, folklore um, artists from the North Caucasus. This is a case about an autochthonous uh, locality in Russia. ORED recordings set up in Nalchik, set up by uh, Bulat uh, uh, Khalilov and uh, Timur Kashokov, uh, who are not professional folklore um, scholars, and uh, since they were since they were kids, they never particularly liked uh, the um, what is uh, called uh, the folklore because what they usually saw there was not much folklore, but rather. Mm, staged uh, uh, performances uh, in the pretty much uh, vein of the pop culture. And all companies uh, um, were usually trying to show or project this folklore image uh, uh, through um, the pop culture. That's why these two gentlemen uh, they were not particularly interested in this. But at some point, they met uh, through a, a common um, acquaintance uh, with the, the French uh, documentalist uh, Vincent Moon, who is uh, recording uh, um, indeed folk music uh, in uh, natural surroundings. Uh, and uh, uh, he did it in Iceland, he did it in and when uh, these guys from Nalchik uh, knew that Vincent Moon uh, was going to come to Russia, they wrote him through um, contact. Uh, and Vincent Moon, Moon is an anarchist. Uh, he is not uh, taking any money for the projects where he participates. Uh, and so they had about 30 films, documentaries, shot in uh, North Caucasus, including Chechnya, and covered pretty much the entire scope of uh, 
of North Caucasian republics. It's very mm, interesting how Bulat mm, got familiarized himself with his own popular tradition. Uh, and uh, um, there is uh, an interesting Moscow group, Bhurpo, which is uh, staging uh, um, and performing pre-Buddhist Tibetan music. So Bulat knew that there is a Circassian company in Moscow, and he went to Adigea um, to meet uh, Zamudin Buchev, uh, who is a, 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 a Kabardinian. But he went to live in Adige because in Adige there is more of a Circassian folklore. And so Bulat went there, uh, had an interview because he doesn't speak uh, Kabardinian uh, uh, too well. And as a result, um, they made a documentary with Vincent Moon. Uh, and that they thought, what should we do after Miss Vincent Moon uh, had left? Uh, and so they decided uh, to travel themselves and uh, record uh, um, local um, folk music in uh, in natural uh, surroundings. He calls it uh, Taiwai um, ethnography. And indeed, uh, the beautiful the beauty of these recordings is the field. Mm, is indeed the field uh, uh, um, spirit. Uh, uh, you hear the clinking of glasses. You hear uh, how people um, talk in informal surroundings. And I think that this is uh, remarkable. Um, Bulat has recently made a podcast for Sigma, which is called uh, uh, Global Zomia. Uh, he interviewed. Uh, uh, pretty much a non-French uh, uh, ethnographer by the name of uh, uh, Hok Kong. What is uh, Zomi? Uh, if uh, any of you has uh, read um, James Scott, it's an area in Southeast Asia when peasants uh, um, stayed out of touch with the state for many, many years. And so this French producer um, goes uh, to different uh, places in Southeast Asia um, and he records their music. And it reminds him of some uh, European atonal avant-garde um, culture. And Bulat interviewed him, and um, there, was, uh, there were quite a few places and common interests, uh, like uh, sublime frequencies. It was uh, So what they're doing is they're trying to find some very unusual mm, uh, folklore um, uh, domains in the world. However, um, I think that Bulat and his uh, colleagues have even some great uh, um, uh, advantages uh, 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 compared to these uh, French uh, gentlemen because uh, Bulat and Timur uh, are uh, uh, studying uh, the North Caucasian uh, region. Bulat is more interested uh, in how this music lives now. And he's trying to see how the modern uh, people in the Caucasus can hear. I, what I, I could show this, uh, just a little piece now, not to, uh, a fragment of this. <laughs> Песни, наверное, все-таки с детства, потому что отец спел народные старинные габардинские. Тогда еще влюбился я в это. А со временем, когда я подрос, я это народные песни потерял, как бы. Я их и не знал. Только вот мотивы в голове все время 
А после армии занялся э, именно песнями. Слава Богу, старики есть, они подсказывают, где что было и как. Все. Там я тебе скажу, вот в лесу, допустим, песня звучит особо по-другому. Потому что там вековые деревья. Вот, видимо, они тоже знают это. Видишь как? В горах, да, по-другому. Я вот Ну вот мне кажется, что поскольку Булат фиксирует современность, он тем... Well, I think that because Bulat uh, registers uh, the modernity, uh, I think that to some extent he uh, makes uh, some of this uh, folklore less exotic. Uh, and uh, uh, when people are wearing uh, um, historical dresses, uh, they do not seem to be modern. Uh, whereas uh, this uh, projection is, I think, is extremely uh, alive, and it's, I think it's a very anti-colonial. It has a great anti-colonial spirit. And the fi final thing I would like to mention with respect to anti-colonialism, Bulat and Timur recorded an album uh, with the uh, songs uh, of the time of Russian-Caucasian war. And uh, these recordings are quite uh, interesting, and the Circassian uh, culture has kept this uh, uh, as a layer uh, and folklore. Um, uh, uh, scholars are well um, aware of these, uh, and uh, uh, although it is never being uh, uh, taken out. Uh, um, to, for the public uh, discourse, uh, and because these conversations are not never politicized, uh, they um, uh, issue uh, the possible accusations uh, of uh, radicalism. But interestingly, that this uh, topic is gradually entering the public discourse. Of course, many uh, are. Um, uh, uh, criticizing them for disseminating these uh, through YouTube or on the internet, uh, but uh, uh, Bulat uh, thinks uh, that the wrong thing to do is uh, to cut out any part of the audience, and uh, they are ready to impart to any audience uh, this culture, this music in Russia, in, in Moscow, in the provinces, in France, anywhere. And I think that um, there is no, in any way, any 
contradiction. Uh, Evgenia Medvin, my colleague and a folklore scholar, um, uh, uh, who had a, a very interesting lecture lately. She was uh, considering and studying Tarantella uh, in uh, Sorrento. And uh, uh, there is no uh, any ethnocentrism. There is uh, nothing uh, uh, that one should be concealing from the public uh, in the vain thought that the public may not understand. Uh, I think that uh, yet another important uh, uh, important uh, tradition of modernity Uh, this is an sort of an avant-garde uh, postmodern approach, uh, and uh, um, I think that this is a, a, a very interesting uh, piece of uh, uh, discourse. Um, and one final dimension: uh, interesting uh, uh, cosmopolitan um, venue in Moscow. I. Um, uh, uh, we wrote uh, uh, an article with Sadat Alimov, uh, of, uh, a sociologist from Tajikistan, who found uh, um, video fragments uh, uh, from Tajikistan recorded uh, by the Gastarbeiter in Moscow. And there's a, a, a lot of uh, difference as to how the migrants are presented in the mainstream culture. And you know all perfectly well what I mean. Uh, and on the one hand, um, this, uh, there is this poetic uh, version uh, as to how uh, people uh, uh, are filming their villages, uh, their mountainous, um, and they think of how difficult it is for them to live in the foreign land. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, um, they are s uh, injured uh, when uh, 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 the Moscow people never differentiate them. Uh, there is this faceless uh, mass of, uh, of migrants uh, coming from Central Asia, and uh, uh, and the people in, from Pamir, uh, from this uh, uh, from this uh, mountainous range, uh, they don't even believe themselves to be Tajiks. Uh, and uh, this accent on their local specifics is just a, a form of individualization, something that uh, um, the public or the society around them in Moscow doesn't seem to notice at all. Neither does have any idea of. Uh, and th there's uh, um, uh, Olga Zhitlina, an artist in St. Petersburg, who is publishing a newspaper dedicated to the culture of the migrant communities. And she was inspired by some of the clips and the, f the, f the, f the fragments, uh, video fragments that people are filming during their lunch breaks at the construction sites, uh, something that uh, you could see and read. Uh, um, but it's not just is uh, 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 inherent in Russia. No, these lunch break uh, fragments uh, can be heard uh, uh, in uh, in uh, Latin America, in um, mm, elsewhere, uh, and uh, they are making themselves seem like uh, pop stars, uh, and are they making uh, remakes? Uh, and Olga uh, Zhitlin. Uh, I think uh, made uh, there is a um, the concept uh, in the in the uh, theory of art there is this distinction between kitsch and avant-garde. Now, watching these clips, one could not make a, an, an uh, expert opi opinion if this is uh, um, kitsch or uh, or avant-garde. And of course, the migrants, uh, the immigrants. Uh, um, have their, uh, of course, uh, uh, own aesthetics. Uh, it's like something like lo-fi or low-tech, uh, something that uh, many artists are trying to do uh, without uh, uh, high-quality recordings, uh, low-tech clips. And you can see this, uh, how this uh, 
um, immigrant workers are imitating uh, their musical instruments. Uh, but uh, Olga also tried uh, to find uh, uh, these musicians, uh, but uh, they all preferred to keep incognito because they uh, don't have much trust in the Russian media and probably the only um, Mm, exception is the Akin opera uh, drama in the uh, uh, Vsevolod Lisovsky's uh, um, when uh, theater, or when Lisovsky met uh, three professional Pamirian artists, uh, uh, Pakiza, uh, Kurpanaseinova, who is in the center, uh, went to for with a concert trip. Uh, Mm, and uh, in the end uh, of the 90s, uh, they really had to to uh, give up music. Uh, they came to Moscow, and uh, virtually for the first time, they got ba went back to to stage when um, this Akin opera uh, uh, performance. Uh, this is a, indeed a, a very interesting uh, combination of tradition and avant-garde because they are performing Pamirian songs. Uh, uh, and uh, in the intervals, they're uh, recounting the stories, uh, the verbatim uh, method. There was a big echo uh, resonance. Uh, the uh, performance uh, was given the Golden Mask Award, and uh, the Arkady Kots uh, uh, recorded several songs, uh, and the Pamir Moskva. Uh, festival uh, took place in June in uh, 2017. And this uh, Pamirian diaspora um, uh, in Moscow met uh, the interested artists, uh, Moscow musicians, and so on. But 5,000 people came. So such was the interest uh, towards this uh, um, event. There are some uh, very interesting uh, uh, um, events. Uh, one of these musicians uh, called me up again once, and uh, I think that he was the only um, uh, uh, non-Pamirian person. Now, this Pamirian diaspora in Moscow is quite specific. Uh, there is this uh, Nur Foundation, which is sponsoring the Akahana. Um, if you may have heard about the Ismailites and Akahana, it's one of the um, uh, currents in uh, Islam. Um, so this uh, regional uh, center in Harog in the Pamir Mountains is being uh, sponsored there. And uh, when they come to Harog, to, to Harog kids um, already uh, speaking um, uh, English, which is yet another um, version or variety of cosmopolitanism, because people, rather than just confining themselves uh, to Pamir, they uh, believe themselves to be part of the larger Ismailite movement in the world. Interview on the other hand, as interviewed because of this joint project with Arkady Kotsir, which is a leftish group, Arkady Kots, if you must make this clarification, was somebody who translated in the international interaction. And I asked him, how do you find common language with Pamir people? He said, we are very much Soviet people. And in this sense, I wanted to understand what Soviet cosmopolitanism stands for. I just put it in inverted commas because it's not an officially adopted or imposed ideology or any sanctioned um, practices as what the British uh, cul culturologist calls conviviality culture. In Moscow, despite the horrendous things we can see because of labor migrants, nevertheless, there is still some reference to the common Soviet past that allows people to find common language. And in this sense, again, we can speak about the difference between the generations, because the artists who acted uh, in this opera, they were over 50, and for them, substantial experience of the Soviet times is still with them. And this is the basis for mutual understanding with people in Moscow. On the other hand, in the next generation, we can see 
uh, their offspring that perceive themselves as part of the major, larger um, Isma Ismailite world. When he wanted to involve new people, people are shy to speak Russian, and it turns out that very often people who travel from Pamir and from Kyrgyz, they speak better if they're under 30, they speak English better than they do speak Russian. And uh, again, and so on. As you see, two further items, I don't want to discuss them at length, but there is a notion adopted by British ethnic ethnicity of the borderline, it's just, or remote areas. This is something that the rest of the world is not focused around us. It's some kind of individualization. As people understand their own specificity, that does not exclude a dialogue with other cultures and other localities. And um, so the, just the conclusion, these three cases are exclusive. They're not representative, and they do not need to make any generalizations on this behalf. But again, they made me think that probably we should speak about different varieties of cosmopolitanism. And in different localities, we may see different version. When we speak about cosmopolitanism, we should not mean uh, that this is some kind of some homogeneous phenomenon. It maybe is some kind of autochtone or religious or local culture, uh, indigenous culture that is local there. Uh, another point because of migration, and not only because of that, because what I've been telling you about red recordings, this is something of cultural translation. And you have to share your culture, what is special about it, to those who do not know anything about it. This is what, uh, in anthropology, we know this effect. When you look at your own culture as something that is you do not know, and in this sense, this is a very useful heuristic moment because you can see something through this optics and this culture. Uh, that, but at the same time, people who just they get something about Syrians which they were never aware of. And lastly. This is some kind of researcher's uh, move. I suppose because of this ethnic cultural diversity, we're speaking about relative communities. We speak about groups. We speak there are some coherent groups that have some solidarity and identity and so on. I don't want to discuss it at length, this approach, but it seems to me far more productive to speak about the reality of the space and to say that there are different types of spaces where people meet and where they find something in common. And this is a more productive way to try to understand what happens in Moscow, Berlin, or in Nalchik. Um, then instead of focusing on differences. Thank you.